Welcome everyone to the Sierra Mastermind. Uh, so today is March 14th. I think it's the 14th of March. I know in Denver, it, they're expecting like three feet of snow. And here in Atlanta, it's like 80 degrees. So depending on what coast you're in, I'm sure you're enjoying spring. Um, well, I am so excited today uh, to be joined by uh, Mike Shum. Um, Mike, if you guys have not heard of Mike, Mike is the co-founder at Profits uh, Coaching. Uh, Mike, you can tell us a little bit more about your background because I, I know you can summarize it really quickly, but uh, tell yeah. everyone a little bit about who Mike is. Yeah, so why I'm here or why you should listen to me today. So interesting story, Scott, and uh, how I got here is uh, by accident, like a lot of uh, stories happen, is that I just, honestly, I grew up really poor, Scott, and uh, didn't have much money. And my dad left when I was about four. My mom was on welfare for most of my adolescent life. And I realized I hated being poor. I wanted to have new clothes or buy a, a car or something. So I don't know why I went this way, but right around 20 years old, I built a company, right? And I was like, oh, I could write a book and I could build a company. And, like, and I did it again. And not knowing that's what normal people don't do, but in 20 to 30 years old, I built 10 companies, a couple in Florida, New York, Manhattan, and uh, they were going pretty good. And I was doing all right. And then um, I had a, a meat distribution company out of Manhattan that was doing well, guys. And then I had a son. That business was almost like real estate. It was 20 hours a day, Scott. It was just grinding. And I realized my son was sleeping when I went home. <laughs> he was sleeping right after I got back. And uh, I wasn't, I didn't see him for like the first year of his life. And I was like, this is crazy. So I sold the meat business and I got into real estate. The, you know, you can be flexible hours and all that. And unfortunately, um, Mike's uh, mother, my ex-wife now, left right around the same time. So I had to figure out how to start a real estate team, guys, and raise a kid at the same time. I was like, wow. Seemed like hell, I'll tell you then, but it served me so well because I learned how to actually run a business and make a, a lot of money with a very limited amount of time just focusing on income producing activities. That worked out really well, Scott, because I built that real estate job, just like the 10 businesses I built before. So it ran like a business, not like a job. And in doing that, um, I was asked to do some coaching around 2014 after that team was uh, very successful. And I realized a lot of you are great salespeople, but you don't have a lot of business acumen, possibly, or you know the, um, the science of real estate, but not the art. So that's where I excelled. And I taught this to a number of agents and teams for um, since 2014 literally like hundreds and thousands of agents. And all of a sudden I could see the results getting better. They started to scale. They started to make more money. The light bulb was going off. I was like, wow, this is uh, exciting. And then going back to my son, really bad news happened. My son got really sick guys about two or three years ago. I forget now. And he almost died. He was that sick. He was 23 at the time. And I was like, oh my God, I got to take care of my son. So I quickly just in the middle of guys, I was getting up at three o'clock in the morning with Lisa, my wife, and we were doing 18 or so Zoom calls a day, every day, 300 a month. It was wow. insane, right? And my son got so sick, I literally had to stop that cold, Scott. Like, sorry, I've got to take care of my son family first. And that's what I did. And then I, we took care of him for about a year. And then the industry kept calling me, hey, hey, can we, we need some more of that profitability. How do we know we're not as profitable anymore or that? And I was like, oh, what are we going to do, Lisa? So that was the advent of Profits Coaching is to come back into the industry and help as many of you who want to be helped with this little bit different style of teaching and coaching, a little uh, outside the box from what you normally get at most of your seminars. On there, so my purpose in life now, guys, is just to serve, right? To help you all uh, do a better job uh, in creating income and quality of life for your families. And I'm going to give you some nuggets today that will do that, Scott. That is amazing. Thank you for that background. I, I really wanted you to share that because it sets the stage and it really kind of gives people a feel for who you are and, and where, where you've come from and what brought you to where you are now, which I think is part of the powerful story of the knowledge and, and information that you're going to share today. Um, and, and so, hey, if you haven't already, guys, drop in where you're calling in from. We'd love to know where everyone's calling in from or listening in from today. Um, it's always fun to see where everyone is part of the country. So, um, you know, I do want to say something that you kind of touched on right there at the end. Um, the one thing I've heard you say over and over and over again is that you come from this place of contribution. And if you just help people and share uh, that, it seems to kind of circle around, right? And uh, and I've always felt the same way from my business philosophies. And then maybe that's maybe why well, you and I aligned so quickly um, when we met a few months ago. So 
Yeah, I, I coach that all the time, Scott. The more yeah. you give, like there's a referral actually ratio I'll, I'll share with you. We all want referrals, right? The referral ratio says you have to give out two referrals for every one that you may receive, right? You mm -hmm. have to give to get and then contribute. You have to help others for them, the world, the universe to help you. So yeah, my goal every day is to help as many people as I can. Mm -hmm. And I know the universe will reward me with that sometime in the future. And it's worked out really well. I've been doing this guys for 35 years now. If you can do the math there, I'm 55 now. I started when I was 20. So um, yeah, it works really well. So yes, uh, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, Cool. So here's what we're going to do today. We're going to kind of do two parts today. So the first thing we're going to talk about is, is something called lead conversion, right? Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about some phases here in a minute. Um, and then we're going to talk about at the end, we're going to kind of leave a little bit of time and we're going to talk about lead profitability and, and from like a team's perspective, but really for anyone in their business, when they're looking at a PL. and l I know it's like, okay, eyes glaze over, but <laughs> these two things are, are huge um, when, they, when they're done right and, and put together. So all right, so to kind of kick things off while we get started, Mike, I'm going to throw it out there to the audience. So uh, let's go ahead and roll our first poll out there. So, and, and I'll kind of read this in my own words, but like from a from a 30,000 foot perspective, right? When we think about a hierarchy of needs um, perspective, what are the three phases a lead goes through um, when they're making a, a decision and whether it's purchasing a house or it could be really purchasing anything. So awareness, rapport, and trust, dream, search, and purchase, aspirational, research, and transactional, inquire, ghost, and then reappear. And that's uh, that's my funny one there. So you guys can go ahead and uh, answer that while we kind of get started. So, all right, Mike, so let's kind of start talking then a um, little bit about this, this, this lead conversion and these phases the consumer goes through. Yep. So, so let me give you one more quad. Guys, if you haven't noticed, I speak very quickly. You'll have two or three pages of notes, at least, I'm sure, by the end of this call, if you you, you stay focused on there. So get your papers ready, get your pen ready, because once I go, Scott, we're going. So here we go. So the first thing we're going to talk about today is the art and science of, of real estate sales. Now, I want to bring this up because most of you are working on the, um, the, sci the uh, science part of it, which is the scripting, right? So first scripting, Scott, just the word itself, I know, especially newer agents, it intimidates them. Like, oh, it's scripting. I got a role play. Oh, it's so embarrassing. So first of all, let me demystify scripting. If you stop calling it scripting and just realize what are the questions I need to learn for this particular lead source, that's what scripting is. Every script expires. You got these 10 questions that almost every expired listing uh, script has on it, right? LP Mama is what, six questions that you need to learn about so just learn the questions. But here's the challenge, Scott, is that uh, in uh, in this journey, when you first um, maybe thinking about real estate, there was a script. We'll use LP Mama just as, as an example here. You didn't know what it was, nor did you care. So you're at this level of what they call unconscious incompetence, Scott, right? You're like, whatever. <laughs> and then maybe you thought of thinking about real estate or getting into sales. And someone might have said, hey, Scott, there's this script out there. If you ever get into sales, it makes converting these leads easier. It's called LP Mama. And you're like, oh, if I join sales, I can learn this. And then we get to step three, Scott, which I'll, I'll screen share here. Mm -hmm. Show you what this guy, what this looks like. This works uh, counterclockwise, as you can tell. First, you're unconsciously incompetent. And then you're consciously <laughs> incompetent. So I know. Now, so they know. So then I know I'm incompetent, right? That's what it's right, saying. There's something out there. But how do, what do I do with this LP mama? How do I use it? So the, the trap here, guys, is a high percentage of all the agents I get, I get to work with get stuck here in the green box called conscious competence. They looked at the script once or twice, or they have it pinned to their cubicle and they kind of know the six questions. The only way to get from the green box to the blue box guys is repetition, unconscious competence. Like a lot of times I get this feedback on calls, God, wow, but Mike, when you say it, it's just so much better. It's only better because I've said it a thousand, two thousand, three thousand times. You've got to practice more to get to this level, because what I'm teaching you next is the art. And if you don't know exactly what to say or when to say it, you have to think. This goes back to a great book by, uh, here's a book recommendation, The One Thing by Gary Keller. Mm -hmm. He taught us in that book that the human brain is not a computer. It could do one thing at one time. So you have to think about the next question, Scott, or you need to read on your script in front of you. This is what I hear on recorded calls often, Scott. The consumer tells the agent they're looking for three bedrooms. And all of a sudden, a minute or two later, the agent says, well, how many bedrooms did you need? And you hear the awkward pause by the consumer, like, I just told you that. 
Right. This is when you're thinking about the next question, Scott, or you're reading that script real quick. Your brain cannot listen at the same time. It's physically impossible. So you need to get to the level of a conscious competence. It happens to me now, Scott, sometimes someone asks me a question and it just comes out of my mouth. I'm like, where'd that come from? It's stored in here, but the repetitions, I can pull it out anytime I want. So please get better at this. And what I'm going to teach you next will be even more effective on there. So, so next. The first, uh, thing, the first thing is knowing what to say. Right. Correct. And then and then really the second step is to internalize what to say. So it becomes a natural part of a conversation and not something that's like you said, you have to think about because obviously you can't think and listen at the same time. Impossible. And again, to get you can get good at that step, I will tell you, Scott. If you want to get great, you have to learn the art on the not just saying the question, what's the inflection at the end of the question? Is it an upswing or is it a downswing, right? Are you adding embedded commands or tie downs? Like there's a lot of art, but if you don't know the basic six questions, you can't embellish it and make it better with the uh, the artist side. I mean, if the science side is not there yet, impossible. I hear a little NLP in there, Mike. Do I hear NLP? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I feel I have a lot of opinions on everything, Scott. And I've taken some NLP courses. I believe most of that for realtors is too much. It's mm -hmm. just heavy, it's complicated, it's detailed, but embedded commands and tie downs are just two small pieces of NLP language. I think you can easily learn them and, and interject those into your language, extremely powerful. So yeah, I like so NLP. Mike, but Mike if everyone on the call today listens and takes a few notes, um, they'll learn something, won't that be great? <laughs> yeah. Yes, it will. <laughs> Scott's taking a few classes too. <laughs> Excellent uh, NLP there. All right. So let's get into the uh, the artistry, right? I'm going to assume now you're going to learn your scripts more if you don't know them more. So um, this I'll give credit to actually. Uh, Scott, you familiar with Jesse B? Uh, I think I have heard of Jesse. Yes. Yeah. Jesse owns a, a software company, helps nurture leads. And this was a talk he, he did with someone else years ago. And it's just resonating. We're like, oh, my God, why didn't anyone else talk about this? And I've made it a lot better over the years. Mm -hmm. So what Jesse was sharing is to get a higher conversion on your leads. One of the challenges, especially on the team side, Scott, is teams that generating are so many leads or sometimes too many leads is that it's pick up the phone find out if they're pre-approved, if they want to buy a house today, if not, hang up and get the next call. And we're moving way too fast because write this down, your client, when you do that, you're missing a vital part of any sales, any industry. The client needs to feel understood in order to get buy-in to work with you. So what I'm going to teach you today is to how to ask the right question at the right time by teaching you the three phases that every lead goes through before they ever purchase a house. The challenge right now, you're treating every lead the same way, no matter what phase they're in. So you're out of rapport with them probably close to 66% of the time because you're asking the wrong questions at the wrong time. Interesting. So, All right, yeah. so before we roll, before we roll, so let's go ahead and take out our results and see if we can get mm -hmm. our answers here to our, so. Basically, from we had 55% think it's awareness, rapport, and trust. Uh, dream, search, and purchase, 36. Aspirational, research, and transactional, 9%. And everyone saw my go my goofy answer, which was inquire, ghost, and then reappear. So uh, interesting. Awareness, rapport, and trust. Everyone looks like that's the top one, right? It does. And even the second one was a close second. But ironically, guys, this, I'm glad we're doing the class. Um, all wrong. Only looking at the number that one person got the answer right. The yeah. answer is aspirational, research, and transactional are the three phases that every one of your leads is going to be going through. Wow. Another great question, Scott. Uh, I like that. So yeah. how do we make them feel understood, Scott, in, in this process? So first, I'm going to teach you how to build some trust really quick. Because uh, we have a lot of uncertainty, Scott, in our markets here for a bit. If you don't know, uncertainty is a trust killer. They don't know to believe the news. They're always exaggerating what interest rates or the market's doing. The agent's telling them another thing. So developing trust as quickly as you can with a, a new lead or opportunity is uber more important now and even a little bit tougher because they're hearing a lot of mixed messaging out there. So I'll give you three bullet points. Write these down on how you could very quickly build trust uh, with any brain. It could be a lead, it could be a, any, any contact. Number one is responsiveness, Scott. People like you a lot better when you respond quickly. Uh, I'll give you an example of this, actually. 
Um, do you guys uh, have heard of Sharon Shravasa, president of Real Brokerage yeah. over there? So that guy is a friend of mine. I know he does a million things from investing to building companies. He's got a family, right? Scott, I don't know how he does it. I could text or email him anytime. He never takes more than 30 seconds to get back to me. I know it's part automation, but it's him because he'll ask me, hey, okay, I'll ask that. And he'll ask me, how's Lisa doing today? I'm like, man, how does this guy do it? But it makes me feel like he really cares about me because every time I reach out, he gets back to me with some kind of response. So be more responsive. Get back to them a little more quickly. Trust goes up. Number two is being not knowledgeable anymore. You've got to be super knowledgeable, I call it. Super knowledgeable means you can articulate at least three what I call knowledge bombs to your consumer in your first interaction with things they don't know. This has gotten to become a much harder game over the years, Scott, because of Google, because of Zillow's.com. There's so much information out there. The consumer thinks they know more than you guys know. If you can meet them at the first introduction and mention a couple things that you know they don't know, all of a sudden they need you. Like, wow. This agent's really smart. I'm glad we found him or her and we should work with them because they know more about real estate than I do. This is where we get devalued a lot because the consumer thinks, why am I paying you all this commission? I'm, I know as much as you do. What are you doing? Unlocking a door, writing up an offer? You know, how are you adding value to my process? Mm -hmm. So you got to find at least three, I call them knowledge bombs and share them on the first appointment or the first interaction and you'll see how they will quickly start paying more attention to you and what uh, and the ways you can help them. Well, no, Mike, you know, before you move on, let's just pause right there, because I think this like this showing showing an example of this I think is really important. And I think you and I, when we um, did our pre-call together, you know, mm -hmm. you had a great example. I think you called it um, your your driveway talk. Right. Was that yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. so maybe share another example from what you mean by this knowledge bomb. OK, that's that's a great question, Scott. So let's just say you're with the consumer, right? They didn't want to meet for a buyer consult. So, yeah. They want to see this one house that you know they think they like on there, which we know they never buy the first house. So now you're outside of the front of the house and you want to work with this client. It seems like after meeting with them, it's the kind of client price point you'd want to work with. So you want to impress them on how you can help them. So, hey, Scott, I know you've been looking for a little bit. Any of those other agents uh, mentioned to you, you know, what the current absorption rate is and how that may affect your purchase? They haven't. Oh, man. You know, if you have some time, I'd love to share with that information with you because it can dramatically help you make a decision on how much to offer or how competitive the market is. And uh, Scott, I also noticed that, that you said you were talking to your lender about this uh, FHA loan you're possibly taking out, right? You needed only like three and a half percent down, which could be a good product. But I need to ask you, Scott, did the lender share the differences between MIP and PMI insurance between an FHA and a conventional loan? They're like, what? They didn't? Wow, I'm glad I brought it up because the FHA loan may look a little cheaper in the beginning, but that uh, mortgage insurance is in the life of that loan for the next 30 years. You can't get rid of it unless you're refi. Maybe yeah. in your case, it could be an advantage to go conventional, like a 3% down with appreciation and get that insurance off of your uh, monthly payment a couple of years from now. I don't know, but please talk to your lender and make sure you're making the best decision there. I have some lenders that I could recommend that could educate you on this topic. Yeah. And so right there, I mean, great examples where now all of a sudden this is the knowledge and the the intricacy of the transaction that the buyers have probably never even thought about or it's not even crossed their mind. And you're positioning yourself that you have the expertise in this area and can even help them in other situations that come up. So yep. um, I think that's great. And then, you know, we also kind of just talked about, you know, a lot of you all know that I sold um, for a time in the industry and I, I would I would talk about products about a property. So, hey, do you know this is called LP siding and it's a class action lawsuit? And, you know, this siding swells if it doesn't keep painted. Now, it's not a bad siding, but, you know, you just got to be aware of it's, it's got a little bit different maintenance schedule on it than maybe a hardy plank would or a hard any kind of a cement board. So, you know, right there, they're like, oh, wow, I never knew that there was different types of sidings out there. And it does that same type of effect. So awesome. Excellent there. So the, the last of the three, not that there's not more, but one I would recommend you lean on a lot is transparency. You got to be brutally honest with your clients, right? The market is what the market is. Inventory is a little low in a lot of markets. The interest rates are what they are. Sugar coating or trying to trick them into like, well, even though interest rates are high, there's still appreciation. If you don't buy now, it'll cost you a lot more money in the future. Like that's very salesy. You will push your clients away with that. So 
what is the real situation? What is their possible outcome? And uh, how competitive is the market? I know like I have clients in uh, New Jersey now, it's they're in multiple offer situations already. So and at the same time, I have a client in North Carolina in a luxury space where nothing is moving. So she has to be honest and say, hey, I'll take your listing, but it's going to take about twice as long to sell as it normally would. Are you prepared to sit on the market that long? She's being very transparent and honest. Clients very, very much appreciate that because agents often do not share that information. They're always trying to figure out what's the best information to share with the client that will get me a commission check on there. So there's a little, a couple of nuggets on how to build trust. Now we've got to make them feel understood. And we're going to talk about art. So art is aspirational research and transactional phases that your leads are going to go through. So in order to make them feel understood, you first have to learn their backstory, folks. You've got to ask them, you know, <laughs> why, why are we even talking? How, how, how did real estate get on your radar, right? How did we get here in the driveway, basically? <laughs> right. You have to know that because, Scott, if you know their backstory, you know how to ask the right question at the right time. Otherwise, you're a one size fit all and you're asking every client the same question, the same way, the same time, and it'll work a small percentage of the time, but you will not connect with most of your leads that way. So let's talk about aspirational first. So this also will help you to understand, guys. I hear agents all the time on Teams, Scott. I want the good leads. I want the Glenn Gary leads. Oh, these PPC leads or these social leads are no good. Mm -hmm. There are no bad leads. The irony is, I don't know if you know this, Scott, but in this country, we produce like 125 million leads, but we only sell 5 million homes. So yes, a lot of these leads are duplicated, multiple companies, the consumer's clicking on this button and that button, and then their agents are getting the same person multiple times. None of them are bad. It's a matter of where they are in the process and how long it's going to take for them to convert. So let's start at the top of the funnel. Like I always like to start, Scott, the aspirational lead. Write this down. They will be in this time frame, guys, from 91 days to 24 months, two years. Okay. So what is an aspirational lead? An aspirational lead is someone who maybe saw something on a website or they watched HGTV or they, a family member moved to another city and they said, wow, I wonder what it would be like to move to Georgia, go to Atlanta. I'm, I'm in Vegas now, Scott, but I'm immediately so curious. What's the weather like? What's the, the demographics? What's the school like? What's the, um, I like convenience. How close is the airport, right? So am I buying a house today, Scott? Just because yeah. my friend Scott moved to, but I like Scott. Maybe I want to be neighbors with Scott, but I need to maybe do some due diligence first, right? So when we ask, if you asked me today, guys, Mike, are you pre-approved yet? I'm like, no, I'm not pre-approved. I'm just trying to see what Georgia's all about, what the Atlanta market looks like, how much are the costs to buy a house there for something I would like. So write this down. When we get a client and we ask them, <laughs> You know, and they, and they give you this feedback, Scott. Oh, I was just looking, all right? They don't want to be pressured into buying because they're not ready. They're not even sure, Scott. A lot of these guys, if they want to buy, they might right. do their due diligence. Like, oh my gosh, Atlanta's got, the humidity is too high there. I don't know. It's too far from the airport. Atlanta the airport's crazy. I can't, I fly a lot. I can't use that airport on there. So we, the first thing we want to do when we get a client is not try to see if they're pre-approved. Is the first question that we want to ask the right question at the right time instead of going straight to qualify, right? Someone and try to close them is to ask them, I'm curious, why are you even considering purchasing or selling a home now? That's it. You need to find out their backstory. What got this on their radar? I kind of made up this story and I told you mine is because a friend of mine moved to uh, Atlanta, Georgia, and I want to consider about moving down there. Oh, so then if you're an agent with that knowledge, oh, so where does Scott live specifically? How close would you want to be to Scott, right? And you start, what's important to you in a new city you might move to? If you answer those questions, I feel like you understand me and what I'm trying to do. If you ask me how many bathrooms or how big of a lot I need at this point, you are totally on a different page than I am. I have no idea. I don't even know what houses look like in Georgia right now, quite honestly. Hey. And it's an open-ended question. And I think that's also important to point out, right? Is because you just basically say, so, hey, I'm curious, what's got you looking at this point? And then you've closed your mouth and you just be quiet. And you let them answer. And you use the two ears that you're given as opposed to the one mouth. 
Yeah, I feel, that's funny, man. I've been doing this so long, Scott, I, I forget what I do, but I would tell you 90% of my language are open-ended questions. So I'll, I'll give them a pro tip there. Everything you ask a consumer, if you could, should be open-ended. I will teach you how to do that uh, very easily, how I was taught. As long as the first word, Scott, of every sentence starts with who, what, where, when, why, how, or here's my favorite, Scott, tell me. Mm -hmm. No one can answer a, a tell me question in a couple words. Mm -hmm. So tell me, Scott, what has you interested in looking at homes in Atlanta in the first place? I can't say yes, no, right? Well, you see, I mean, my wife, and, and now you're learning the backstory. Let me give you another bonus about this question early on for specific types of consumers. Scott, I slow down a little bit and uh, I asked the consumer, so, hey, what has you looking for a house in the first place? Well, you know, I've been with my wife for 10 years and things just kind of fell apart and it looks like we're going to be getting divorced. Oh, oh my God. Someone who tells you their baggage story does not want to repeat that story to a whole bunch more agents. Once they've shared the story and you've got built some trust, they will be very loyal to you. <laughs> That's not something that they're proud of. Nor So getting their backstory and letting them feel understood in that situation is pure gold. Well, and Mike, that works, that works well too with financing. I found that if you connect them to say your preferred lender and you have that initial discovery call about their financial situation, to your point, if they have a few things they need to do, pay off some debt, do this, do that to be able to buy, they don't want to repeat themselves multiple times, right? It's the same similar genre of what you're speaking yeah. of. Um, yeah. And that, that rapport and that trust is built. That's that's great tip. Yeah, huge right there. So now, and again, Aspirational. Maybe, like I said, I find out. Well, thanks for letting me know the humidity is, you know, 99% for the whole summer. I lived in Florida for a while. I don't want to do that again. And I may not buy a house, but you are a good resource for me. And uh, we move on. Next is the research phase, guys. Well, so let me just hold on. Let me just stop yeah. right there. Hold on. I, I <laughs> want to cut you off at the end of that. One, but so now let's just, this is the little thing. Like, you know, what we can do is we can build out an action plan that when you meet a person that is in this aspirational phase, that we can then have this slower try to, it's not a sending them a property every day, right? It's more so an education, videos about their, their parks in the area, videos about, you know, restaurants that are nearby, because they're in this aspirational, you know, field, not, not this, hey, I need to see every single listing that's sitting in the market every day, right? So anyway, just kind no, of- No, you nailed this, Scott, because you just jogged my memory, right? I had a very smart realtor in my journey. So we were, uh, guys who know me, you know, I move around a lot. We lived in New York, then I was in DC for a while, Florida, SoCal, now I'm in Nevada. So in the move from uh, SoCal to Nevada, I wasn't sure what Vegas was if I wanted to move here, right? I was an aspirational phase. So they weren't sending me houses. You know what he sent me, Scott? He sent me um, a cost analysis of uh, what it costs to live in Southern California compared to Nevada. And it's, I'll tell you, it's 33% cheaper. And I was like, wow, how much do I make a year? And I could keep 33% more. That was definitely a catalyst that got me a lot more excited about moving to Nevada than him sending me a bunch of new, uh, new homes that came on the market today. And I will tell you, that was one of the catalysts that got me a lot more excited about living in the Henderson where we live now, because I pay a lot less taxes and I have a lot more fun going to the strip and spending my money down there than giving it to the government. So there yes, go. those kind of things, right? Cost of living, weather, schools, entertainment, convenience. That's what you want to flood them with, Scott, <laughs> when they're just kind of figure out if this is something we want to do or don't. Excellent. All right. All right. Next. Sorry. Didn't mean, didn't mean to no, no, I want you to do that because I, I move fast and it's good to just slow me down. <laughs> so next, guys, is the research phase. Okay. What is the research phase? So first, I'll give you the time frame. Most consumers will spend somewhere between 31 days and 90 days in this phase, right? Month, two months, three months. So the research phase, uh, you can also dub uh, due diligence. How do I know, Scott, if someone is in the research phase? The difference from the research phase to aspirational is they've actually gone out of their house and are start looking at homes. It could be uh, open houses, it could be scheduling some appointments, but they've kind of gotten past aspirational. Like, you know what? 
this might work, but let's see what these houses look like, right? And what, what are the floor plans and what are the communities, you know, surroundings look like by actually getting out on the road and um, going to homes on there. Oh, and a great thing that you just said there about open houses and, you know, also new construction is like they don't have to commit to an agent. They don't have to, you know, go in and set an appointment to go see a house because, you know, someone that's setting an appointment, they probably are further down the line in the next phase. But somebody that's right. in that aspirational phase doesn't really want to intrude on your time or, or you know, those types of signs. Yes, you're 100 percent. They, they're not sure. And if they're respectful, which most humans are, yeah, they don't want to waste your time because they know they might, not, they might not even do this yet. So, yeah, great observation. So here's some stats you want to write down. Now, these numbers, Scott, very well could be a little wonky because the market's crazy wonky. But these are NAR stats, I'll tell you, that I, uh, I've been using for a bit. And uh, they'll come back to this, I'm sure. So the first thing you guys need to know is how many properties does the average consumer feel they need to look at or they actually look at before purchasing one on there? You can put that in the chat, actually, if anyone knows. <laughs> you want to drop how many homes does the average? Now, some will be smaller, right? Uh, like if you have more of a driver-like personality and uh, an analytic may look at more, but this is the average of all the consumers in the U.S. Uh, how long do uh, do we think that it would take to um, get them to purchase a house? And the answer <laughs> is 10. 10 homes, folks. All right. This nugget is a lot of value to you guys if you know how to use it. So now when I get on the phone with a consumer... I can determine pretty much where they are in the process, Scott, with this one question, now that I know this number. The question is, hey, Scott, I know you called about this house. I had a quick question. How many homes have you seen so far? Hmm. If they tell me zero, Scott, where are they? Probably That's aspirational, true. maybe starting to calling about a showing, maybe getting into research phase. Scott, what if I've seen five homes? Right. So they've done some diligence. They're getting closer. Right. And then when 10 is an average, they might be pretty close to finding their home. What if they're at 10? This is when you want to be much more um, frequent with your communication and be really on top of things because they're getting very close where they their brain says, OK, we've checked a few towns. We've checked a few styles of homes. We've um, guys, people don't buy a home, I will tell you they do a process of elimination. Oh, that's too far. Oh, these houses are not nice enough. Uh, these are have an HO, we don't want to do that. And they back into a process of elimination of their home. So, so, so then, yeah. So let me ask a clarifying question around this. Those 10, could that have been an open house? Could that have been new construction? Could that have been not just a scheduling an appointment as oh, well? Uh, great question. Absolutely. Because here's what happens in real life. What happens, Scott, if uh, a consumer comes to your open house? What do you ask them to do? You ask them to register, right? <laughs> and you have their email address. Where does that go? It goes right into your CRM, like if you're using those apps that drop it in there for you quite automatically. Yeah, like Sierra. Like okay. Sierra, right? That's a, And then they're going to drip on you, right? So every time I call, every time I go to a website and I leave my contact information. So here's the irony, Scott. A lot of agents think, oh, I'm going to set you up on a drip campaign, Scott. They don't realize they're probably getting those exact homes every day from five, six, seven other agents. And you think you have this unique uh, value proposition. I'll sit chip on a, and they can set themselves on these campaigns now anyway. So there's no differentiation there, guys. Probably still do it, but it's, there's little value to that. So can I so, throw a little, little tech yeah. tip in there? So, mm -hmm. so with Sierra, right, you do that. You can set up your e-alerts and you can have properties being sent. Well, the other thing about Sierra is that you as the agent can see what properties are being sent, right? It's pretty much similar to most systems. A, a really good best practice, Mike, is the property that the clients have opened up three or four times, or they maybe liked or put a heart next to, is to take that one and manually send that property to the client and say, hey, Mike, you know what? I, I was thinking about you today. I know you're set up on our drip search, but this property came up and I think it's really, really close to what you're looking for. And I just wanted to make sure you saw this one. And mm. by sending them that one particular property that they've already viewed two or three times, and you know they saw it two or three times because of your Sierra system, or they've liked it, um, you, you know, it's it's a way to stand out from that clutter from those five or six other open house e alerts that they're getting. Yeah. If, now you got me going. I have to give you another one. So right. my team, I had a, a similar system as well. So looking at the the house or two they hearted, 
it, their job on my team is to look at that hot sheet, those new listings that come out every morning before the consumer did. And what we were looking for is to see one of them on there before the consumer and say, hey, I don't know if you got a chance to check your email yet today, but I know you looked at this three bedroom two over here. One even nicer for less money came up today. Take a look at it when you get a minute. And now the consumer feels like you're a proactive agent working for them mm -hmm. and not what happened last year, Scott, 70% of all buyers located their home on their own, but was not given to them by the agent. This is part of the problem with commissions on the buy side. The yeah, buyers right. doesn't feel the value. I'm finding my own house. I'm telling you when I want to go see it, you're going to meet me there. And if I say yes, you're going to write up a contract and make a lot of money. That's a big problem for consumers out there right now. So just by my team coming in and just sending that email half an hour, an hour before they saw it, totally changes how they feel about us. We're working for you now. You're not working for us. So Scott, we're in the research phase. This one is probably the question most agents get wrong when I ask it. So what's the right question to ask uh, in the research phase? Let's assume, Scott, that they uh, have looked at, I don't know, five or six homes. The right question here, guys, is why weren't any of those previous properties a good fit for you? Because I told you five minutes ago, guys, it's process of elimination. So a good example would be Lisa and myself, is we had a, a, a ranch style home in California, Scott. And we really liked that, having the one level, not having to go up and down. I move around a lot. I work from home. Much easier. So if my agent did not ask me, why I didn't want certain homes. And he set me up on a drip campaign in Las Vegas, Scott. I don't know if you've been here. I would say about 80 to 90% of all the homes are two-story homes. If every morning I got a bunch of two-story homes, two-story homes with one ranch, do I feel like my agent understands me? Not at all. I probably don't want those homes. But if you don't ask them what they don't want and you keep sending them in their inbox, they feel like you don't understand anything about them. So I'll re reiterate this question. It's super important. If they've looked at any homes, don't go about what do you want? What do you want? What have you eliminated? What don't you want? And this is how you get from not having to showing them 100 homes. Okay, I don't have to look at two-story homes, right? Then maybe pools. <laughs> I don't want a pool in my house or whatever. And they will feel you are actually listening to them and helping them with this process of identifying a home through a process of elimination. Yeah. Uh, I have to give my wife um, kudos. Her name's Lorelai. She runs a team here in Atlanta. And um, I hear her on the phone and I hear one of her clients sending her a property. And let's just say this property is, um, you know, a, a four bedroom and it's an unfinished basement or it's on a slab. And I hear her saying to her, well, you know, when we initially talked and we had our initial consultation, you told me that you needed at least a five bedroom and you needed to have a full finished basement. This is home on a slab. Why are we even thinking about going and seeing it? Right. And and and, and <laughs> you know, the customer was like, or the client's like, oh, you know, you're right. You know, and and so, you know, that's the same principle. It's that same process of elimination that you're talking about. Yep. So now. Still in the research phase, guys, right? 31 to 90 days to reiterate that. We said they may look up to 10 homes in this phase. And Scott had mentioned <laughs> they're registering at the open house. They're, they're registering to get some uh, drip campaign or some listing sent to them from some website. Here's the, the interesting part that the agents don't realize. <laughs> How many agents does the average consumer talk to, work with, inquire with uh, when they're buying a home? Same number. It's 10. 10? It's wow. 10. Think about it, right? They're going to go to this open house on their own. Like you said, they don't want to bother an agent. So they go to open houses. If they go to five open houses, different agents this weekend, they got five people chasing them down. And so, yeah, NAR says the average consumer will interact or contact 10 different agents. That's what I said earlier. They're probably all sending them the same properties you are. And if you don't call them before they find them, You've devalued yourself and you've commoditized yourself. They're looking at all the agents the same way. And so I just, I just saw uh, Amanda part, part, um, in the in the chat just go wow. And I have to say, Mike, you kind of blew me away with that one too, because from our paradigm, like as again sitting in the agent seat, like I have, you know, I, I, I you feel like you're the only one. You feel like you're the only one that they're either reaching out to, sending them properties, right? And so having that paradigm, that mindset that you're competing out there with ten other folks, um, you know, is a really good thing to keep. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's shocking. I mean, think about it. But again, I don't make up the data. I just interpret it and read it back to you guys. That's the data and what it, what it's showing right now. And it makes sense because, like I said, in aspirational, you're not got one agent and calling them every day. A week or two might go by, Scott, and something pops up on the site. You're like, hey, we're going to drop Billy off for baseball. Let's stop and take a look at that house and stuff like that. So <laughs> here's uh, where we're going to get from research phase into transactional phase. Scott? So transactional phase, I'll give you time frame again, is going to be the last 30 days. What's different in the transactional phase than the research phase? They've done enough due diligence and they're comfortable to write an offer, right? They feel like they've done their homework and it's it's okay for us to uh, purchase a home now. So let me help you here with questions on there. So every consumer I've uh, worked with, Scott, told me they need a three bedroom. They need bedrooms, bathrooms, how big the house should be, uh, maybe where it should be located, um, a school district it may be in, all of this stuff. Right? And I think uh, if you've been coached or trained at all, they would tell you, tell your consumer, you know, make sure we'll get you all your must haves and uh, about 80 percent of what you'd like to have that even someone who builds their own home wants it different after they're done building it. Like there's no perfect home out there. So we're going to get as many of these things for you. But by accident, Scott, total accident, when I was working with buyers back in the day, something happened to me twice, and I realized that's not the best strategy. And here's what happened, guys. I had a consumer, and they gave me the laundry list, you know, three bedrooms, two baths, whatever their, their criteria was. But I remember specifically, Scott, one of them was they had some kids, and they didn't want to be on a very busy road, right? They were worried about the kids and traffic if they were playing out in the front of the house. So I... I acknowledge that. And then uh, they called me to look at a house. And uh, I went to go show the house and they love the house. They wanted to buy the house. And I was like, wait a second, guys. I remember you told me earlier on, this is what they call a double yellow line road. That indicates there's probably gonna be a good amount of traffic on here. And I said, Mike, it's busy, but it's not that busy. And I was perplexed. Here's what was happening, guys. And here's a good bonus tip for you. Every consumer has a list of things they want, but there is one thing on that list that will trump all of the others. So in this case, it was a gourmet kitchen. The wife saw this kitchen with the built-in mixers and the big counter space, and she could bake and cook and all that. If they find the one thing that's most important, they will justify a lot of the other things they've told you. I've had buyers buy homes in a different school district than the one they told me they had to be in because that house had an attribute, the one attribute that was really important to them and they will purchase and they will justify the school district kind of as good as the other one on there. So yes, listen to them, get the laundry list, but listen more carefully. What is the one thing that's most important? And I will sometimes use a strategy. They tell me I'll use the gourmet kitchen example, guys. Hey, Mike, my wife really wants a gourmet kitchen and we're looking in a certain town, certain school district, and I'm not seeing one. So I'll call the consumer if I see a really nice kitchen outside of what they told me was the uh, search area. But mm. with professionalism, hey, Scott, I know you and your wife said you wanted this gourmet kitchen and I kind of know what it is, but I'm not sure exactly. I know this is not the house for you, but a house came on the market just yesterday in the next town over in different school district. I know it's not the house for you, but I want to just meet you over there. A few minutes, have your wife take a look at the kitchen and let me know, is this in her mind would be an ideal kitchen? Scott, do you know what's going to happen when your wife goes to that house and sees that kitchen? She will want to buy the house. Mm -hmm. So I heard tip there. exactly what to say there too, Mike. You know, this may not be for you, but right. <laughs> uh, yes, I, I do a lot of guys um, anti-selling. I don't try to close people. I try to push them away. And the more you push them, this is a hard thing to coach. It's an advanced skill. The more you push your clients away, the more they want to work with you. The more you try to pull them in and tell them you're number one and you're great and this and that, the less they want to work with you. So this is more advanced skills, but yeah, all my, I have no closest, right? I just, I don't know if this is the right house. Scott, hey, Mike, should we buy this house? Think it's a good house? I said, Scott, you're going to live in a house, not me. If you think you would like living in this house for a long time, you should buy it. If not, we should keep looking. You want to buy this house, Scott? That's how I talk to people. I'll give you, I'll give you this best script, actually. Uh, I'm going off script a little bit, but this is a powerful one, talking about anti-selling. Whenever I meet a new buyer, guys, they're like excited. They want to go see houses at all. And I say, hey, Scott, before we get started, can I ask permission for just one thing? And Scott will say, yeah, sure, Mike. What is it? Scott, I've done a lot of corporate relocation work uh, over my career. 
And a lot of those guys told me that they thought they'd be living in my community for a long time, but they happened to be, Scott, I learned really good at their job. So their company is going to make them an offer they can't refuse to go fix another problem somewhere in the country or open up a new office. And the average uh, um, time of stay in my marketplace for a relocation client was 18 months. Mm. So 18 months, they call me, Mike, I can't believe this, but they want to move us back to the other coast. And uh, I have 10 days till I start this new job. We got to get this house sold. I need the equity to make a purchase. If that consumer had purchased a house, uh, Scott, that had an eclectic floor plan, it was kind of different and cool. I learned it was very hard to sell quickly and get them to their next place easily. So I would tell them, all new buyers, hey, Scott, because I've done all this work before, if you and your wife find a house that you really like, even if it has that gourmet kitchen, if I believe I can't sell that house quickly for you, if you called me in a year or two, would you give me permission to say we should keep looking for another house and not purchase this house? Because I want to be able to help you if, God forbid, you got into a situation you had to move quickly. And I know homes with funky floor plans take a lot longer to sell. Yeah, and that's instant trust. And that's instant, instant. Yeah, I'm not trying to sell them. I'm trying to protect them from a, a situation down the road that I've, I've been in that could happen to them. So yes, that's a very good nugget. I would use that every time you meet your next buyer and trust will get built uh, much more quickly on there. Now let's talk about these 10 agents, Scott. So what do you think the the, uh, the catalyst is? So I got 10 drip pins coming in, me and Lisa. We see our dream house came up on uh, some website today, right? And we want to go look at it. Who do you think Lisa and I are going to call? Now, out of these 10, I'll tell you, the consumer probably likes and trusts about three of them. Mm. The other seven, they've already discounted, like we're never going to work with them or they're not responsive. So Scott, out of the three that we like and trust, they showed us a couple homes. They gave us some good information. What do you think determines who we call? Any guess? Proactive reach outs. Last interaction, last mm -hmm. interaction. If, mm -hmm. if I had dinner with uh, Scott and his wife last night, they're going to call me today. Or if I had a communication with one of them yesterday, they were going to call me today. If I haven't spoken with them in quite a while, <laughs> ever who interacted with them last is going to get the call. So when you see buyers that are at the uh, in that eight, nine, 10 stage, right, going from research to transactional, you want to stay extremely close because all we're waiting for, especially in this market, Scott, with low inventory, is for that consumer to find something they like. They've done their due diligence. They're ready to go. It's a waiting game to finding the right home. And you want to make sure you're the one of the three agents that gets the call. You have to stay in touch. Uh, there's plenty of stats on this that you've got to reach out to a client no less than eight to 10 times to have any real chance of converting on it. So. Unfortunately, yeah. and that's okay. huge. And that's huge. I mean, then it goes through selling anything, right? I mean, it's it's that keeping in top of mind that's so important. So so important. So we keep in touch with them, right? And then when something pops up, we're the agent of choice. You have an easy sale with someone who trusts you that you added value to. That's real estate sales, in my opinion, on there. So let me give you one more way to look at this differently because I, I made this. Uh, oh, let me give you the stat though. This because uh, I know this stat and it was reiterated at a conference I went to a couple of weeks ago. Scott, do you know? I just told you you need at least ten outbound reaches to a lead to ha have a good chance of converting it. Do you know nationally? And this number has been the same for years. How many times uh, an agent salesperson reaches out to a lead in the U.S.? Average. Average of all the agents, all the leads. 0.75. You're close. It's 1.2. <laughs> it's 1.2, folks, right? So it's not more leads. You don't need more leads, guys. You just need to call the ones you have about nine more times. <laughs> That's the gap. I'm telling you it's the gap. I've had teams I've coached, Scott, where every agent had 100, 200, 300 leads in their Sierra CRM. And as an experiment, I thought it would work, but I'm telling you it works. I cut them down to only 100, conversion went up. Then I said, what if we went to 75? Conversion went up. What if it said every agent only had 25 leads a month to worry about? Conversion got maximized. But wow. agents want more and more, and they think that's how they make more money. You all will make a lot more money, for whether you're a team or if you're a solo agent, by calling less leads more times than buying or capturing more leads and calling them 1.2 times on there. The, the other analogy I want to give you here, is I, I realize what I'm teaching you guys, a parallel that you've all been through, 
is a doctor's appointment, Scott. Mm -hmm. So Scott, could you imagine if you weren't feeling well today and you uh, went to the doctor and uh, you look a little pale and as soon as you open the door, the doctor says, Scott, you look really pale. Here, take two of these blue pills and you know, give me a call in a few weeks. How, um, how trusting of that advice would you feel, Scott? <laughs> Not at all. Mm -hmm. So you guys want to become doctor-like because I remember in my head whenever I go to the doctor, hey, Mike, what brings you into the office today? Does that sound like, hey, why are you even looking for a house in the first place? Identical, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's why. And uh, how long have you been looking? Oh, right. How long have you been feeling this way? It's right. the same questions. You need to sound like a doctor asking a lot of questions of why they're there. How long have they been feeling this way? Right. And then um, other clarifying questions to understand them, not to sell them. Because now, Scott, after the doctor says, oh, six weeks and the pain has been primarily right here. What if I touch over here? No, that doesn't bother me. Scott. What? Yeah, that's it. And put your arm. Oh, yeah, that's it. He does all this right stuff with Scott. Then he says, hey, Scott, you need to take these two blue pills and that pain will go away in about two weeks. Same diagnosis. Right. Here, take them as soon as I see your pail or ask you a bunch of questions. Which doctor do you trust more, Scott? The latter. Mm -hmm. All day long. So be more doctor-like. And I think the biggest thing is slow it down. You have too many leads and you're trying to rush through that script. And are you pre-approved? If you're asking people if they're pre-approved in the aspirational stage, you just lost them, right? You're totally gone on there. So anyway, awesome. that's three phases of the lead. So remember, there's three different phases. Identify where they are and then ask that right question aspirational, right? What has you thinking about a house in the first place? Um, the next phase is research. What have you eliminated already so I can help you find what you really want? And then once they're, they've done that, find the one characteristic that's most important and sell on that house. That's mm. great. It is, it is awesome. It is awesome. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, right there, I mean, taking that and just implementing that into your business and taking one step at a time by starting to identify the leads, where they are, what state, phase they're in, and then asking those key questions that you outlined um, per those phases, that could be the takeaway from the mastermind today, right? Just start implementing that. And then the scripts, of course, getting to know your scripts and your questions better ahead of time. So at all times, it's, it's uh, what I find, uh, unfortunately, uh, in today's market, Scott, with uh, some, some teams and some agents, is they're getting too wide. This is real estate sales, and there's few agents that are doing very well, but I know a ton of agents that are starting a podcast, or they're trying to sell a product, or they're, they're trying to find all these other distractions because they, I don't know, they, either they don't like the sales part of it, or it's not that busy right now, but in a slower market, guys, the what your job is to do is to survive the slower market, right? You're not going to get rich in this market. There's low inventory, high interest, there's a lot of uncertainty in the market, so your job is to get through here because real estate is a cyclical market, Scott, and better days will come. Mm -hmm. But right now it's slow and you have to make twice as many calls to make half as much money. That mm -hmm. is the market. <laughs> you have to accept it because I, I heard this great quote once from someone uh, who was very smarter, than, much smarter than I, Scott. Any market you try to challenge, you will lose. The market will always win. You can only take what the market's willing to give. And this is what it's giving us right now. So make twice as many calls, meet twice as many people to make half as much money. So you're still in business three or six months from now when interest rates do come down. And then all these people that you think are ghosting you or they disappeared, they are there. I'm going to give you the good news, but they are waiting because me and my wife are in the same situation, Scott. We're looking to purchase maybe later on this year, but I'm dragging my feet because I'd like to get a little better interest rate. I'm in a 3% deal, but I feel myself getting more comfortable. I feel like, yeah, maybe at first I was like maybe in the fives, but now I'm like, yeah, maybe 6% is close enough for us to make a move, right? On there, your consumers are doing the same thing. So keep in touch with them much more frequently because you, I, Scott, no one knows what day that Fed is going to say, hey, we Let's need to drop rates. interest rates. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, go back to what I told you. Who are your consumers going to call? All the ones you think go to you? The one that's kept in touch with them the best, the one that's gave them the most knowledge and the most trust they feel connected with will get a ton of business when that happens. It's not going to be a year, Scott, where like, oh, yeah, we do sales. It's going to be like way low. Like, oh, my God, <laughs> I can't even keep up. And all of a sudden it was like so slow. And now all of a sudden it's so busy on there. That's my prediction uh, for what the market probably looks like uh, this year. 
Yeah. And on that note, I know we're, we're getting close on time, but I did want to touch on our last topic here, which is mm -hmm. profitability and the formula for getting to that profitability, right? Yep. Um, and um, just in a matter of saving time, I was going to ask another poll question of, well, what is the ideal profit margin for a team? But mm -hmm. you know, I'll just go ahead and say, I think you and I teased this out, that being at a 25 to 30 percent profit margin is where you can be to survive this market. Does that sound right? Well, that's where you would like to be. But uh, again, I um, I read a lot of P&L, Scott, for, in what I do. I have a lot of friends in business. And that's the goal. But very, very few are there right now because it, it's based on something that I call adaptability. Mm -hmm. Most people in real estate are salespeople, not really true entrepreneurs. So like I told you, you can't challenge the market. So that when the market's shifting, they're not adjusting their businesses to match the market. So they're carrying a lot of the expenses that they had when the market was hot two or three years ago. Mm -hmm. Revenue is down. So their profit margins are getting squeezed really, really hard. I get calls every week, Scott, multiple calls. Hey, I'm not making any money. I don't know you know, what to do. Can you help me? So let me help them with that. Um, and if we go a few minutes longer, this is recorded. It doesn't really matter. Yeah, right? it's okay. I mean, if people yeah. have to drop, they have to drop, but we can certainly capture the content for sure. Yeah, they can catch the capture. Yeah, because if you're a team lead, you, you want to hear this because what I'm proud of and what I, I think I do well in, in helping others is to simplify. So if you're in sales and you're good in sales, Looking at numbers, reading a PL is the last thing in the world you ever want to do. Mm -hmm. So I've broken down everything you need to know. You just have to know five numbers, Scott. It's really, really easy on there. So I'm going to go through, have a pen and paper handy if you're still with me here. I'll go through this quickly now. And then uh, I, have a, I, can, I can redirect them to get a copy of this thing at the end of the call. So number one, guys, just write these, uh, these words down and then I'll show you how they fall into a spreadsheet. I'll screen share something for you. So top is what we call gross revenue, Scott. So let's talk about a team. I think is a good example here. So they might be bringing in, I don't know, a million dollars a month in, in gross revenue. Now, over the, the last couple of years, models have changed a little bit. And teams, that's what they used for the real trends list, Scott. Like when they talk about their, their, their GCI or how much, uh, how much um, commission income they brought in. But over the last couple of years, a lot of these bigger teams have uh, connected with the lead companies that charge mm -hmm. a very high fee. Some of them as high as 40%, may even go higher, who knows. So in figuring out your, your numbers on your profitability, Scott, even though this is your gross number that might get you on the real trend list, you first then have to subtract any of those big checks that you might be writing to a lead company because that is not your money. Even though the agent you know closed the deal, you never get to see that money or play with it. It's owned by the lead company. Secondly, yeah, different than cost of sale or is that yeah, no, that's different, no. right? Mm -hmm. This is different. Yeah, way different the way I do it. I got my own system, but yeah, that's going to come up next. So then under that too are brokerage fees. If you're at a brokerage, right, and they have some kind of fee or cap model you got to meet, again, you may have earned a GCI, but you can't spend that money. You can't use that money. So we subtract uh, any fees from the brokerage from that top line gross revenue number next. Okay. So what we have left, guys, is what I call the GCI to the team. So in my world, that's your real GCI. <laughs> that's the money that we can pay agents with or expenses or grow the company with. Mm -hmm. So immediately, I see it's part of the disconnect. A lot of teams are using that top line GCI to figure out profitability. And literally like hundreds of thousands of dollars over the year could be not mm -hmm. there. And you're running your business on a fictitious number. So how much of that money can I actually use to grow my company? So that's the GCI to the team. Okay. Yeah. So here, here are the numbers that are most important. So you have that number now, right? If you have no lead fees or brokerage fees, great. That's your top line number. Next number is called COGS, C-O-G-S. That stands for cost of good sold. The cost of good sold in a team model is the split that we pay to the agents. So um, again, because I see a lot of uh, team leaders are empathetic, Scott, I think they make a lot of emotional decisions, not logical ones, and they like the agent or the agent's going to leave or they don't give them more. And this split number starts to go up over time. The challenge with that is they don't realize the impact of just giving an agent 5% uh, more, because if you're at, say, 20% uh, profit and you mm -hmm. give your agents only just they go from 50 to 55, it doesn't seem that bad, right, Scott? But now right. your bottom line went from 20 to 15% profit. <laughs> that is a huge number. Mm -hmm. So 
in order to get these numbers that Scott spoke about, 25, maybe 30, 33% profitability, my target's always 33, I'll tell you, Scott, I get a team, I've done that a bunch of times, is that you need to keep your COGS number between 40 uh, to 45%, I would tell you. It's two ways to do that. Well, there's multiple ways, but I'll tell you two easy ways. One is just you break out buyer and seller because seller opportunities from the team are worth a lot more. So that can be like a 25, 30% split. Mm -hmm. Maybe buyers are a 50 because there's more work on their side. And secondly, or this has gone up over the years, is having a transaction fee. So for every deal the agent sells, we pay them whatever they're 40, 50%, but then they bring in revenue to the company for, I've got some teams I've worked with in the past that are up to, I think, $1,100, $1,200 a fee for every transaction. So combination of what you're actually paying them or some transaction fees, you want to keep that number and then with a four in front of it would be great, 40 something, right? Once you get 51 plus, you're going to see profitability is going to be harder and harder. Okay, next one are salaries. What do you pay your people, right? And this includes the employer contribution, right? Um, when you have to pay employment taxes on there. Mm -hmm. Very simply, one more number, two more numbers, marketing. So what are we spending to generate opportunities? And then by default, Scott, any other expenses falls into a bucket we call operations. So let me screen share this. I can show you what it looks like and then... Uh, if you guys want a copy of this, we'll put up a QR code. You can go to the website and download your, your own version of this. So here's what it looks like in real life, guys. So this uh, fictitious team here had a, a million one in revenue in, uh, we'll say, we can slide January here. And then uh, they paid 200000 to a lead company. The broker took 100000 So they only had 875 to play with. Mm -hmm. They paid the agents uh, their 350 Salaries were 105, marketing 85. And what I do for them, Scott, here is I break it down in percentages. This is what you guys want to know right here. These percentages, write these down. Here are your targets. So I told you your COGS number would love somewhere between 40 and 50, right? Closer to 40, much better. Salaries, 12% of this GCI number. You don't want to be more than 12% of this number to hit these profitability goals. Marketing, you can see here, 10%. We don't want to spend more than 10% of the money we're bringing in on marketing. And then that last bucket I told you, whatever other expenses, insurance, computers, I don't know, rent, uh, whatever it might be, you're allowed to spend the 8%. So what I've noticed in building hundreds and hundreds of teams, Scott, uh, over the years, it costs about 30% to run a, a big team, a decent sized team on there. So what I tell people is it's going to cost about 30% here, right? If you're paying your agent say 50%, Scott, you can see right off the bat, your maximum profitability is 20%. Yeah. Yeah. And again, with the slowdown, these, these, these revenue numbers have declined, but they're not cutting these numbers. I see this all the time. And there's not a lot there. If you spend an extra 10% more here and you pay your agents 5%, your 20% just went down to 5% profit margin. Yeah, so, and what are you doing? Then what are you doing this for? I mean, why are you going through taking all the risks, spending all the money, and coming away with five percent? Yeah, let me give them a, a better way of going about that. Because what I did is right, I went to how much money is coming in, and I broke it down. That's the mistake. Here's the best way to use the chart, Scott. Is first tell me what do you want your profitability margin to be? So you see this chart. We have a thirty percent as the example. So then with a very good educated guest, Scott, knowing your team, the market and where it might be. I, I don't want to be a stretch goal here, Scott. How much revenue is this team going to bring in in the next 12 months, right? And then it forces you to make a budget because now <laughs> you can only spend the 30% uh, or less of that number to hit your margin. You actually create a budget and, and every month you, you compare your budget to the actuals. And as long as those uh, your your revenue is where you think it is, and your expenses are thirty percent or under, you'll be in the twenty to thirty percent profit margin. Mm -hmm. But everyone does it backwards. They how much money do we come in? Oh yeah, we got this spent, that expense, and they say how much is left over. And in this market, hardly anything, unfortunately. Wow. So yeah, start from the bottom and just create a strict budget on what you're allowed to spend to make the margin versus see how much is left after we spend all the money.
So if um if someone wanted help with this, right, and and they're really not a numbers person, and they're just you know they struggle, like what is this something that you know you guys help people with? Do you do you? Oh push yeah, so, on yeah this, good question. This part? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, so my purpose in life, guys, I said it in the beginning, is just to help improve the quality of other people's lives. And if I can help you make more money, that'll make your business better, and obviously a lot of other things. So yeah. I'm a, a yes to anyone who needs help, wants some help. If I can give you some great advice, it makes my day. It fills my heart. So we, if there's a, I think we have a slide somewhere. There's a, we have a website up there. You can download this, right? Do you have the? Yeah, I think we have a QR code too, and we have the. Yeah, this is. I think it's it's your to your, It's right to your website, right? This one right here. Uh, yeah, like, profits.com. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So on there, and then I'm on uh, social as well. You could uh, find me on Instagram or Facebook, follow me there. And then, yeah, if you go to the site, Lisa was nice enough, that chart I just showed you, she worked hard this week to upload one of those to the site. So you can just easily download it and then you could work on the numbers. But if you need help with this, you're not sure. Um, I think you could schedule a call in there. I don't get involved with all the, uh, the back end stuff here and, uh, or through DM me, I don't care. Reach out to me. I can help you figure this out, figure out your margins, what I've done for uh, probably a few hundred teams already, I think, this year <laughs> on there. But, and not that I'm not smart, guys, but after you've done the same thing for like 30,000 calls and you've done this for 35 years, you get pretty good at it. So I know what wow. to look for and I know how to, how to help you guys fix it. So yeah, more than happy to help anyone. Or if you have any other questions or inquire about the company, let's set up a call and uh, we're here to help. We're here to serve. Well, amazing information. Um... I actually, you know, I, I'm I'm writing down the things that you're saying, and I've heard you say them several times already, um, and because they they apply in, on all different phases, right? So it doesn't matter if it's real estate or software sales or whatever. So yeah. uh, obviously, guys, um, you know, we'd love to hear your feedback. You can send this feedback to hello at sierrainteractive.com. Um, also, if there is any other topics that you'd like to hear us talk about in the future, please. Please, please feel free to, to email us there and let us know. Um, it, you know, if you learned something and you think it was valuable, please share with a friend. Um, if you didn't like it, well, then you don't have to come back. No, just joking. <laughs> uh, but uh, it was a pleasure to be here with you today, Mike, and uh, spend this time. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you for the opportunity. Love to share. Everyone have a, a great week and just hold on. we got a few more months and things are going to get better. I'm I pretty agree. sure. I feel it. <laughs> All right. All right, guys. Have an awesome day. We'll talk soon. Bye now. Bye-bye.